He's an ex-British soldier. And six years ago, during the final minutes, and I mean the final minutes of the Falklands War, he was shot in the head by a sniper. I got out of them by a head buffy at 762. Get him under cover! Come on! Come on! Oh, 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 oh. During the battle, I thought to myself, nothing will ever matter anymore. Nothing will ever affect me anymore. The white cross grenade fell out. And there it is! Isn't this fun? And that got translated by the likes of the media into some sort of true grip, firing with both hands, which was pretty much bollocks. I remember the old boys saying that all the Scots Guardsmen came back from, uh, uh, you know, where Normandy with their weapons. So at the time in the battle, I'd run out of ammunition. I'd got pissed off with trying to get magazine, empty magazines back into bloody 58 pattern webbing, which was now all wet and swollen. I'd already taken the decision to throw my mags when they were empty. Um, and I took to pick up Argentinian FNs. Um, the trouble with that is, of course, you never know what's in it when you pick it up. It could be completely empty. Um, so, but I wasn't going to throw away my SLR. <laughs> um, I then had the misfortune of stupidly thinking I could change the mag on an FN because it looked so like an SLR. But it has a different magazine clip. Um, when people are shooting at you and things are going bang, you don't stop and start examining the weapon you're holding. So that's how I ended up with the two. Um, and that got translated by the likes of the media into some sort of true grip firing with both hands, which was pretty much bollocks. <laughs> I like myself on a ridge with my arms in the air shouting, isn't this fun? That's bollocks as well. But, I'm, cl you know. I'm glad we cleared that up right from the start. <laughs> yes, oh. it's it's funny. My 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 friend um, Howie was in four five commando in the Falklands, um, and he said to me, "Chris, all this bollocks about you know safety catch." I was SA eighty, so it was change lever off magazine. Check it. It's in the Falklands. That was all out the window. He said, "You." fired your fucking weapon as fast as you could get them rounds off get that magazine throw it as far away as you can <laughs> reach in your combat jacket get another fucker on cock it and and yeah, yeah. He's, he said when they got back to four five they, the first thing on their program was weapons drill <laughs> and he said all the lads were just staring at the floor and the the um the pw the weapons instructors like Come on, lads, show a bit of interest. That, like, nah, it's all bollocks. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, as you said, it was, I had a smock. I got hold of a, 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 a smock. And they're the best because with your belt on, you just shove it down the front of your jacket. And all this idea of nicely in and out of pouches goes out the window. Everything is just inside your smock. Um, you look like you're pregnant. Um, when they cut my kit off when I got injured, uh, much to my amusement, a white frost grenade fell out. I had completely forgotten about the preparation of grenades before the battle. Um, so the first time I tried to t pull a pin, I really couldn't do it. I had to crawl back and get another guy to help me pull the pin out because I hadn't prepped it. That was my cock up. You know? <laughs> and... Um the one bit of the film I, I bet they did get right was your oppo having to shake you because you were still, <laughs> was it with some girl you'd met downtown or your girlfriend? I was late for the um, together at Chelsea Barracks to leave to go down to the QE2. Um, and eventually my orderly, my radio operator, was spotted with two SLRs, which rather gave away the fact that I wasn't there yet. I did get given a shitload of extra picket duties as a young officer as punishment. I got out of them by head butty at 762. <laughs> it's, um, uh, I mean, you've had a lot of stuff to deal with, Robert. I mean, not least of which having a major 
BBC production brought out about your experience was was that I mean that just from my experience of the media and it can really turn on you that must have been just an issue in itself to deal with I mean it does turn on you and to some degree and I'm sure it's the case for you Chris you've got to be an idiot not to realise that you're putting your head above the parapet and the media will do this you know papers will spend five days saying what a great guy you are, and then they'll do their next two days saying what a complete dickhead you are. Um, and, you know, you just buy into that. My point of view was a few. My personal one, selfishly, was that I was trying to create a new career for myself. I went into film and television via theatre. Ironically, in those days, I was still able to meet a lot of the boys who'd been members of ENSA, the Second World War Services Entertainment System. So I got to work with people, believably enough, like Spike Mulligan, who suffered terribly. Um, All sorts of people I met, Derek Nimmo, uh, uh, Lord Ricks of Whitehall. You know, they're all ex-Second World War guys who'd served. My agent was a guy called Richard Stone, who had an MC from the Second World War. Um, So I was doing it to pursue a future life for myself. I was also doing it because I think it's important that these things are talked about, that events in history are remembered. Um, I was pissed off at the time that um, the standard of post-care for veterans was so appalling. Uh, I was also pretty bemused by the concept that a government could fuck up so badly that we'd end up in a war. And then because we, an apolitical force that defends the country, wins that war, they get re-elected. I couldn't quite work that one out. Um, So those are the things I was doing. And it was of no surprise to me that that opened the gates to a few bits of criticism. You'll always get it. It's water of a duck's back to me. I really don't give a shit. The people who often make those criticisms weren't there. Um, I understand the boys that maybe had a few criticisms that were there. You know, it wasn't a war about me. Um, It wasn't a war about any individual or any individual group. Uh, I also speak up now because um, the Scots Guards did incredibly well to go from public duties out there and take on their fifth Marines. No one's taking anything away from our brothers in the parachute regiment or our Marine friends. Um, They did an amazing job. Uh, and they carried the fitness that allowed them to do that yomp, as they call it. Um, without a doubt, uh, praiseworthy beyond belief. But, you know, the Scots Guards did an extraordinary job to go from public duties to being on, on the front line in a place that far away and eventually up and against their Fifth, fifth Marines who were well-trained, um, well-dug in, uh, well armed and, and equipped in a way that the British Army really wasn't. I mean, look at the equipment we took down there, the joke. Um, but that's what we Brits are good at landing on the wrong side of the island with shit equipment and getting on and doing the job that needs to be done. Yes, and uh, at incredibly short notice, wasn't it? Sure was. <laughs> yeah. But it's rushed away, you know. What? It's the 40th anniversary now. Is this a difficult time for you, or do you have to compartmentalise this in some way? Every year on the anniversaries is quite difficult. I had a bad year a few years ago. A number of my boys uh, died, you know, through alcohol abuse and, and not being able to cope in many ways afterwards. Plus, you know, 40 years on, even if you were the very youngest maybe down there, there were a couple of naval ratings who were maybe 17. They're now 57. You know, the numbers will not be retained for long. So 40 anniversary, the 40th anniversary of any event like that is always going to be a big one. I mean, we're all mortal. You know, uh, it's amazing that I'm still here. Um, so to that end, it's a big one. Every year it's always dredges up a bit that is quite hard. Um, But, you know, I feel slightly duty-bound for the guys. You know, there are a lot of guys who would not want to do what I'm doing right now. 
sit in front of a screen talking to you. Um, there are a lot of guys who suffer terribly and families. That's the big thing for me. Uh, our association is called the Tumble Down Veterans and Families Association. It's the families that have suffered for our eagerness to soldier. And we did eat. We were eager to soldier. You know yourself. You, you get the opportunity to go and do what you've trained for. You want to go and do it. Um, we rushed to, get jo to join in. The families aren't quite so happy. I now have a son serving the Scots Guards. And with all the shit that's going on in Europe and Ukraine, you know, my wife sits there and goes, oh, my God, what happens if this escalates and he goes to the front line? I know that as a 27-year-old, he's partially aware of that uh, and not stupid about that. But as a soldier, that's what you want to do. Go and soldier. Yes, my um, best mate growing up, his dad was the... Um, sergeant major in lima company in the falklands and every night you won't remember this because you were down there but for us back here after the news they used to put they, they had to put, put the news of the dead I know. and my mate had to watch that He's like 10 years old you know to see if his dad had died that day yeah. He used to just take himself up in the bath and run himself up and just cry in the bath because he had, you know, he's ten years old. He's got no one to, really? no one to, no one to share this with, and to think there's people running off to volunteer in Ukraine now, it, leaving three kids behind, and they're laughing about it as though it's. Ah. Well, I a lot of Walters going out there. Um, you know, guys are all my time serving, you know, a lot of them have done a couple of weeks and not knowing anything. Uh, look, you know, men will always do this kind of shit. What the country needs to understand is this is not new. There's one year since the Second World War, and I think it's 1969, when a British, uh, British serviceman hasn't died due to some sort of conflict. One year. We've lost people every year. We've done Malaya, we've done Borneo, we've done Mau Mau, we've done Northern Ireland, we've done Kosovo, we've done, you know, Rwanda, we've done Sierra Leone, we've done everything. Mm. And it goes on. And it's important that a country is educated in geopolitics and educated in what it takes to try and form a better world. And maybe had they been better educated, they wouldn't have been so completely stupid about things like Brexit. I'm not saying our, our place in our system in Europe is right. I'm just saying that the world has to work together. We know it does. We know it does for environmental reasons. We know it has to for geopolitics. We know we have to share this planet with too many of us. Um, so to my mind, a lot of it is about failing to educate. People will sit there and say, oh, well, my granddad was in the Second World War or my granddad was in the First World War and they never spoke about it. Of course they didn't speak about it. Everyone was involved. Why would you talk to the guy next to you in front of the family when you know he knew? You know he knew what it was about, uh, where all the civvies had, had known what was going on. They'd all lost people. They all had people out there. You didn't need to sit and talk about it. And when you did talk about it, you talked about it to a friend who understood it. I often found that, you know, the fathers of girlfriends after the Falklands and the dad had been involved in the Second World War and he would talk to me. And the family would say afterwards, oh, dad never talked about the war. I can't believe he was talking to you about it. Of course he talked to me about it. I had a degree of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw it partially as worthy of discussion and portrayal. Um, I also know what people are like, and if they sit down and can watch a movie, maybe it's easier to do that than it is to sit down and watch a serious, hard-ass, informative documentary. So that was my aim. Uh, the dilemma, of course, is that movies are drama. They're never accurate. You've only got 90 minutes. Um, you've got to try and do stuff. But that was the risk I took. That was what I tried to do. And hopefully... It um, just seeped in a bit. Was um, 
it was Colin Firth, wasn't it, that played you? Yeah. Yeah. you were you upset that he wasn't handsome enough? Absolutely. But, um, you know, I've helped him as best I can with his career. <laughs> and I hope he's very happy. He's a good lad. We got to know each other quite well. Um, you know, these actors take it all very seriously and good for them. That's their job. You know, here we are. All people are suffering PTSD because they watched uh, Will Smith slap whatever his name is. Well, get over it, really. Get over it. Go out, go out to Ukraine and tell me you're shocked by watching a guy slap his wife. You're slapping this guy commenting on his wife. It's a joke. Robert, what was it like for you and your men when um, the Welsh Guards took that terrible hit? Well, I mean, I think as a soldier, I mean, you're a Marine, so you understand it better, but as a soldier, the concept of sitting in some big metal box that gets hit and goes dark and fills with smoke and starts melting around you is just one of the worst things ever. I mean, I... I wouldn't even particularly like to be a tanky. My aim is always that I can dig a hole as fast as possible with my fingernails and get my face in it. Um, so it was horrific. Uh, and the minute that sort of thing happens, the whole question as to why they were still on board, why they hadn't been got off and put on the ground as fast as possible, why it was sitting there in daylight, comes up. But, you know, that's what war is. It, you know, if it all ran smoothly, then it would all be done by Americans, you know, with second wave had the Coke machine on. You know, that isn't the way war happens. We lost all our um, heavy lift aircraft on the Atlantic conveyor. We lost a lot of our close air patrol cover on the Atlantic conveyor. We lost our ambulance equipment on the Atlantic conveyor. Um, you know, what do you say? Had the Argentinians invaded two months later, the winter would have already closed in when we got down there. We would have frozen on the mountaintops. Had the Argentinians waited a couple of months later, I think that the British government were looking at uh, getting rid of one of the aircraft carriers. You can't go to war with one aircraft carrier. If that gets sunk, where do your boys land? Um, this is just what happens. It's the way it goes. We've had people out training Ukrainians. I've known of them out there doing it for the last year and a half. We've known this sort of thing is ticking forwards and moving forward slowly. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just the way life is. What was it like? You were a young lieutenant, so second lieutenant. Does, lieutenant. Yeah. Did, does, does that... Were you troop commander or you two IC of the troop? I, 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 it's been I, so long ago for me. I was, uh, you know, as far as I was concerned, I was quite fortunate. I joined very young. I, I signed up as a potential officer with my O levels at 16 and a half. So I was one of the few platoon commanders that was not even still on my first troop uh, platoon sergeant. You know, you know what it's like. Your first team sergeant, for goodness sake, listen to the guy. He's got so much more experience than you. When you start moving on to your second and third team sergeant or troop sergeant, you're beginning to have an influence of your own. I was already uh, served in Belfast. I'd been in the fourth row for a six and a half months emergency tour. I was a jungle warfare instructor in Brunei. Um, so I saw myself, no matter how young, and how babyish as being one of the more experienced platoon commanders. Uh, in those days, there was an effort on behalf of the recruiting people to try and get in uh, university officers and things like that. My older brother joined uh, and had Cambridge paid for. Um, so he was one of these university wallers, as far as I was concerned. I'd gone in through brigade squad uh, at the very bottom level at sort of not quite 17 and, you know, had gone up slowly um, but solidly, served in Belfast, served in Kenya, served in Brunei. And so when the Falklands came along, 
I was bugging if I was going to be standing in the Tower of London or out store or inside St. James's Palace. I wanted to be there in green, not in red. Mm-hmm. I'm very proud to be a guardsman. Uh, we have some excellent soldiers, no doubt about it. Um, it was important after the terrible occurrences with the Welsh Guards uh, and the obvious questions that there were always going to be about was a guard regiment that had been doing public duties able to go straight into combat. And I think had we not performed the way we did, then in this current financial climate, or certainly one that's been around for a while, you might have found the household division turned into a ceremonial unit, which is not what we want to be. We are, we do ceremony, and we do it bloody well. But we're soldiers. Yes. And the best, um, in my opinion, the best regiments in the British Army are always the one with dual purpose. You know, Marines are soldiers, and they're Marines. Parents are soldiers, and they jump out of airplanes. You know, riflemen are soldiers, and they're you know, riflemen. Guardsmen are soldiers, and they're guardsmen. This is what you need to be. You need to keep the boys busy. Hmm. So when you were lined out at the bottom of that mountain, have you already dealt with it in your mind that you're probably going to lose people? Your, your, your boys, I mean. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, <coughs> and we had done in the diversionary attack, um, it tends to raise your determination at that point rather than break you, is my experience. Um, I was going to be more broken by waiting around in the cold. You know, um, the approach from the start line, which was, you know, seriously, <laughs> you know, your ass was doing this because they had better night vision equipment than we did. Um, we're going a long way in a silent approach. Um, and with no uh, contact happening at that point as we approach, which is the aim, um, my worry was they weren't going to be there. You know, mm. and why when I'm held back waiting for the companies in advance of us to do their job, even when the fighting starts, I'm there thinking, shit, I'm going to die of cold waiting for these guys up front who are having all the fun. Now, that, that sort of turns around when you start having the fun. And the question is, is it always fun? Well, no, it's not, but it goes into that kind of, you know, I won't just use the cliches of a uh, red mist, but you know it does. Mm. Uh, and my job as a platoon commander is to provide the momentum to lead from the front. Um, and you suddenly have an awareness. I'm not saying first world war, because bloody hell, how do you compare to that? But you know, you've got your supporting fire coming, let's say, from your left, obviously your right flank attack. So supporting fire is coming from your left. Supporting fire is coming from your guys behind you. And enemy fire is coming from you in front. You know, this is not the spot to be in. It is the required spot for a platoon commander. And when I eventually was able to look around me on... Uh, the Uganda, the hospital ship Uganda, you know, being the belligerent shit I am, I said, where are all the other two commanders? Why hasn't everybody got a platoon commander? Now, we lost platoon commanders and a lot got injured. So it was a rash and stupid comment of mine. But that was how I felt, you know. If you're going to get shot, the likelihood is the guy leading with people shooting from behind him and in front of him and to his left and to his right is one of the guys that's going to get hit. But that's our job. Mm-hmm. You can't have it all. You can't wear it up here and take the salutes and then not go and do what your duty is. Mm-hmm. Were, there, were there a lot of landmines in front of you? If there were, we weren't checking them out. You're just taking your chances. The uh, diversionary attack had gone in. Uh, they basically uh, taken a spot to take a bearing from, 
they'd assessed that that was an Argentinian position off in that bearing, and they judged the distance. That night, they advanced from that spot on that bearing, stopped, used our useless IWSs to look around, couldn't see anything, couldn't hear anything, so advanced again, did that two or three times before they heard snoring, looked down and found themselves surrounded by trenches. Um, a message came over one of their clansmen radios. It was very loud, I gather, because I think it came from one of the uh, light tanks that was in the very background trying to get supporting fire, or ready to get supporting fire. That, of course, woke all the Argentinians in the trench in front of them. Um, a firefight commenced in which we certainly had two killed um, and a lot of close calls and a lot of injuries. Um, and to give you an idea that you know what it's like, one of the guys who'd been shot fell on the ground and his mucker picked him up, threw him over his shoulder. And as they broke contact and ran out, the guy carrying the injured guardsman stood on a mine. They both went up in the air. They both landed. The guy who'd been shot then picked up the guy who just stood on the mine and lost his leg and put him on his shoulder and they ran out together. What do you say? You don't. There's no words, are there? Bloody hell. Oh. It's, it's all um, suddenly got a bit, a bit real for you all. Exactly. And, you know, that was the case for all of our people down there. What the Paris suddenly found themselves dealing with at Goose Green, what they did on Longdon, what the Marines did. Um, you know, listen, we as a country and as a nation, and I say country broadly because I'm Scots and proud of it, um, we're bloody good at this. Mm. I'm good at football. We are good at this. And so how it was how was it for you when you started to take casualties? Well, as I say, I think the point was that um, really casualties at that point up your dedication, your, your keenness to, to contact and pay back. Um, you know, it's afterwards in the cold light of day with the realities there that it's awful. I mean, it's awful at the time. <coughs> but uh, at the time, you just want to avenge what's going on. And it increases your determination. So that's that is what it was like for me. Uh, I think afterwards, it comes back. You know, it's those... Also, you know, I was lucky. I went back to a military hospital in the days when we had military, proper military hospitals. And if you can remain in that family fold, no matter how broad you call in the family, uh, it's easier. When you end up those years later on without your mates, without your muckers, without the family, without the career, without the structure, that's when the devil comes out and dances with you. Mm. Did you have problems with the booze? I've got no problem with booze as long as I can afford it. <laughs> yes, good answer. I mean, disagree. And I've just had to check in with a new doctor. And, you know, they do that. How many units is how many? And I said, I'm an alcoholic, not a fucking accountant. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I think, you know, the family has suffered. Um, I've just always presumed I wouldn't be around that long and, you know, you're confusing me with, me with someone who gives a shit. Well, nobody thought you were going to get off that hill alive, did they? Not really, no. Uh, 762 to the head, not, not to be recommended. Um, very complex. The uh, medics and the surgeons... Uh, are and have continued to be staggering people. Um, you know, things like the severe cold down there was no doubt uh, an influencing help to survival. 
the fact that it was a closed head injury, I mean, open head injury, meant you got no build-up of pressure in the skull because the skull's broken. But uh, <coughs> what can I say? I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it to anyone. No, you're not selling this to us. Well, and, as officer, they say. And Robert, I mean, God, I, 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 forgive me if you're sick of talking about this, but I mean, literally, you you had taken that hill, and you you taken that mountain. This was just a, a was it one last trench that hadn't hadn't been cleared. I think it was. I think it was withdrawing Argentinian troops, so the the best ones had hung on as long as they could, um, and then they started retreating out themselves. There's an argument that they were trying to organise a counterattack. Um, if we'd been stopped on that top of that mountain, we would have been in clear sight of any FOOs of theirs in Stanley. They could have called down DF on us. And, and we would have been in big trouble. They also had a lot of troops in Stanley. So had they managed to keep them disciplined, they could have come back. Uh, I had tried to do a reorg because that's what you're taught to do. And then I found that I didn't really have anyone to do the reorg with um, for obvious reasons. Um, I also knew from my intelligence report that there was an administrative cave at the end of tumble down of some sort and i thought there's nothing i'd like to do more than get my hands on a fat cook that's what i was after um but uh in the attempt to reorg we came under fire i think they were trying to break contact to, to extract themselves or they were preparing to do a counterattack. and i realized at that point i had to get the momentum going again and get going up that mountain. So I did say with a couple of guys, uh, those features are very difficult. Um, if they've got the high ground, it's very easy to lob grenades down on people. If you're at the bottom and you throw a grenade up, there's a very good chance it'll bounce back down at you. Um, you know, you can be under artillery fire up on those mountains and, you know, a certain number may hit the peat and disappear into it with a big whop, but if it hits a rock, then it goes off properly. So there's a lot of variation of what's going on. Um, and it was purely trying to clear the end of that mountain, keep the momentum going, make sure that they really did sod off and not regroup to counterattack. But I was doing with the last couple of guys um, and ran past the guy. Whether they were snipers or not is irrelevant. I don't care. And, you know, the concept of a sniper suggests he'd been lying there for it, it, you know, It's a very well-trained Argentinian Marine who's extracting himself off a position that he thinks that they've now lost. And either looking at the potential to counterattack or is trying to keep our pursuit off him. So they're stopping and they're firing at us as we're trying to keep the momentum going and push them off. Um, ultimately, the guy that shot me stopped firing in my direction, sat down and faced away, in other words, faced the, the route the way I was running, and let me run past him. And then he shot me from behind. Have you ever met the chap? <laughs> that ain't happening. No. Do, do you know who, who it is? Um. No, no, I mean, I'm in touch with some RGs, and I've had the most extraordinary communications with some of the more intelligent Argentinians who've been very honourable about our treatment of them as soldiers, our behaviour, their behaviour. Um, I wouldn't go back there, although it's a lovely place, I'm sure, because you just don't know what knob is going to come out and go ape shit and try and do you. Um, or try and do something or charge you with war crimes or something chronic. Um, I don't know the guy. I don't believe he got home. Mm. Yeah, they still take it all so seriously, don't they? Well, you know, they're driven by 
stupid, you know, political, you know, if we think we've got dickheads for politicians, which we certainly have, they've got bigger ones. <laughs> you know, and uh, it's extraordinary that people are diverted from their true domestic problems by some historical concept <coughs> that these islands are theirs. And, and maybe these islands are theirs, but that's not the way to do it. And the people living on those islands, who cares whether they're British, Argentine, or whatever, if they dem democratically want to be run in the following way, let them be run in the following way. Mm -hmm. you, know, you really want to encourage your chance of, of putting something like a name to those places, then, you know, send some fresh milk, send some up-to-date newspapers, and maybe 150 hookers from Buenos Aires would help that cause as well, you know. It, it's a, probably a cliche question, but it's it, it, probably no more time than the 40th anniversary that, that makes it appropriate. Um, but it, did Thatcher do the right thing, or is that just so open to interpretation? I think without a shadow of doubt, as a war prime minister, she did the right thing. Once they had landed and done what they did, um, <laughs> to not hesitate, to crack on and come back with full vengeance and, and determination was without a shadow of doubt the right thing. Whether they ever should have got to the point where they were able to do that, whether they could have been warned off with a couple of our naval ships going down to the area in advance of it happening, and they would have pulled out of the idea, whether, you know, sanctions against a guy like Galtieri, he was killing his own people <coughs> and uh, running his own private little domestic war with the missing, um, et cetera. Um, you know, whether they should have done something first, uh, without a doubt, they should have done. Um, mm. But once they stupidly allowed him to do what he did, she acted in the correct way. I mean, all you have to think is, sitting in your own home, if some guys come in with shotguns and start waving them in your face and trying to nick your bits and bobs in your home and threaten your family, you would expect a team of negotiators to come in and solve this problem. And if they fail to negotiate their way out, or your way out, then you would expect a team of policemen or whatever to come in and save you. We were no different to that. Impossible to explain, isn't it, for young people listening now, what, what it was like as a nation to sail 8,000 miles to reclaim our territory. And gosh, it's just... The emotion of it all. Uh, Suddenly put under armed control by a group of people. Forget whether it's theirs or it's ours as a territory. Do not walk into people's homes and wave machine guns in their faces and tell them that from now on you speak a different language, you drive on a different side of the road, blah de blah de blah de blah de blah If you do that, people like you, Chris, and people like me will come and sort you out. Yes. How, how many men did the Scots guards lo lose in that battle and, and down there in overall? Nine dead. Um, and everyone has a brother, sister, mother, son. That's the point, you know. When you lose someone on a battlefield, one guy goes down. When you look at it down the road, there are wives, children, parents brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts. So the one guy is expanded hugely in reality. Um, so, yeah, we're not dealing with the numbers that were dealt with in other wars. Um, but it did come out of nowhere, didn't it? Let's be honest. Mm. Um, and it is mor moronic that we can't deal with this kind of stuff. Um, there are a few things, you know, I, I love soldiering. So, you know, partially when we think of Ukraine and things now, 
I would go back to the old adages that if you want peace, prepare for war. I've got no issue with war. It's not right. It's not good. There are too many people on the planet anyway, so let's have a good dust-up. How was it coming to terms with leaving the regiment? Well, that's the worst bit, isn't it? That's the worst mm. bit. You know, you find your place, you, you do your best. Um, you go from being a fiercely proud young person, fit, trained, to being in a wheelchair, wetting yourself. That does sound pretty much like a Saturday night in the Marines, but that's another story. No. Yeah. Um, and you made quite an impact, didn't you, on that TV show? I, I don't know. Uh, was it Gabriel Burner or have I completely got that r- right? Wrong. Gabe. Gabe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, You. that was pretty impressive. Media guy. So he had the power to talk to his guests as long he, you know, like one of the originals that I don't know, Parkinson, Jonathan Ross's, you know, interviewer. Um, and it was one of the first interviews I did where I got the chance to sort of talk. Um, and, you know, I was aware that the British government and the establishment were very nervous about me as a young officer speaking out. Um, and that just encouraged me. Really, because I thought, why are, you, why are you so worried? Come and pat me on the back and ask me to say something on your behalf. I'll say it. But when you run around being paranoid, maybe there's a reason you're paranoid. Yeah. My mate used to say, if you think you're paranoid, it's because you probably should be. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had that audience just in silence, though. It was quite, um, I don't. It, it wasn't a British thing, was it, really, to speak out about the rights and wrongs of war? And, and you were very, you courageously did, and not, not just courageously did, but after having half your bloody head blown off. Well, I saw it as my duty because I think that, um, you know, I, I was a platoon commander then. I still have a duty to my soldiers. Um, and Scots Guardsmen, and people forget what it was like in 82, um, you know, before any t- attempt by help for heroes, before Headley Court was sorted out at all. Um, and it's ironic, you know, for God's sake, Charles I created the Royal Hospital with our fantastic guys there, you know, hundreds of years ago. After the Crimea, we created the Corps of um, Commissioners who gave people jobs running the entrances of big banks and things in London. 2020, we have guys sleeping on the fucking streets. Mm. There is a duty of care by government to look after the soldiers, and et cetera, that they put forward. And caused to and, and asked to work for them, you know. For God's sake, it's not that complicated. <coughs> work out some sort of point system. If this person's been a policeman, if this person's been a nurse, if this person's been a fireman, if this person has helped our society, give them some theory points so that they go ahead and get the council house when they need one, ahead of others. The world isn't fair. Let's not try and pretend it is. Yeah, I think we all have to get our heads around that one, don't we? My, yeah. my dear old Nan always said that. Life ain't fair. <laughs> I think if, that's, if, you, if you make that your starting point, um, stops us feeling sorry for ourselves and then, and then things start to happen. Was there a particular kind of t- turning point for you, Robert? Because one thing that came clear from the the film was the anger and I'm guessing, I mean, you, you're dealing with ma- trauma that no one else can understand. Did it, did you have an epiphany moment? We thought, right, hang on, let's, let's take a different direction here. I think, you know, there was what I called at the time a cynical awakening 
you know, when I came back, um, as I said, I was lucky enough to stay in military hospitals, etc. But when, you know, you discover that the boys who were injured weren't allowed to take part in the victory parade, when I discovered that, yes, I could go to the memorial service in St. Paul's, but I wasn't allowed to wear a uniform, um, you start saying, well, hang on, what's going on here? What, why? You know, what are they ashamed of? Why are they hiding us? Why are they picking the images that suit them? Um, you know, my parents ended up telling poor Simon Weston's parent, mum, which aircraft he was going to be on. <coughs> and they found out from journalists. Because, you know, the British Army aren't just useless at PR. Mm-hmm. They don't trust their men, and they don't know how to do it. So they end up picking, you know, people they think they can control, and then you, they find that they're dealing with someone like me or Sarah Weston, who's far too bright just to be controlled over the years. Um, and they're just not very good at it, and they don't trust us. I mean, we've seen that in the Falklands, they kept the journalists back, kept the journalists back all the time. When it came to Afghanistan, the Americans embedded them. And when these embedded journalists came back from patrols, they said, my God, have you seen what these young men are doing for our country? And they wrote them up brilliantly, and they, they acknowledged their, the amazing work and stuff that their young soldiers were doing. As long as you hide the guy in the back, all he's ever going to do is write the rumours and write the scandal. Mm. Put him out the front. Let him see where the cross of arms grow. Um, perhaps you can explain this for our friends at home. We, we, we've seen those, uh, I don't know if iconic is the right word, but those awful clip, film clips where they're, they're burying the dead, the, the regiments are burying their deads down there. I can. I th- there's a particular poignant one of the paras yeah. placing, placing their men in a trench. And w- are those is that like a temporary thing, and then they're re- yeah, that, that's a temporary setup uh, before people are you know taken home again and dug up and taken home, uh, which is the way that you know we've done it for a long time now. Um, people need to understand the history of after the First World War. It was politically decided not to do that because of the massive massive, massive numbers of dead. And if for years after the war ended in 1918, there'd been shiploads of corpses being brought back to England, you can imagine. I mean, all you have to go and see the war graves now, see how many people or what it looks like. And those are the ones that were found and identified. Um, So, you know, they didn't bring them back after the First World War, for that political reason. Uh, we have uh, returned and repatriated the people from the Falklands. You know, classically, the Argentinians didn't want to repatriate their own for the same political reasons. Um, I've never understood the numbers suggested by, of Argentinian dead. I just think it's so inaccurate, it's untrue. Um, but I don't know. Mm. And was this one of these ironies? Did this bring you closer together as a family? You know, I mean, it must be unimaginable for a parent to hear the news that they must have had to hear. I mean, awful. I, you know, I, I do come from one of those kind of, you know, families. I, you know, I had two great uncles killed in the Second World War. I had a father in the Royal Air Force, a mother in the Royal Air Force, a grandfather in the Royal Air Force, a grandfather in the Northumberland Fusiliers, a brother in the Scots Guards. I've got a son in the Scots Guards. We've done this for a while. On to brighter climbs. What 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 do you do you, with yourself these days, sir? Well, I've moved back from France. Um, mainly because I have a daughter who needs to be in England. She's got some sort of uh, learning difficulty issues. Um, so I've just moved the family back from France, and we're about to attempt to um, you know, start finding a, uh, 
a new home for ourselves. So we're just in rental accommodation, which is very nice. Um, and just trying to find our feet. Um, obviously, this year, 40th anniversary, I feel I have some duties to do. Uh, I'll be up to Blackpool um, over the anniversary, so sort of 10th to the 14th, whatever, um, because I'm uh, honorary president of the Tumbledown Veterans and Family Association. So we'll all go up there, have a few bevies, have a few chats, um, do a bit of a march, have a few uh, a service, remember our fallen, uh, and then go our own ways for another year. Mm. And do you, are you sort of phys- how was how was it after your recovery? Did you did you get into sports or anything? Was, was there any particular? I'm guessing. I, I've got a fully paralysed left hand side. Um, so that, was uh, your, that was your gymnastics career ended then. Was indeed, and and my piano forte career. Um, yeah, it, it comes and goes a bit. Asbestos is not good. I had a fall last year because um, I tripped on my paralysed foot and trapped my paralysed arm between my rib cage and the ground. I thought I'd cracked a rib or two, um, knowing there's virtually nothing you can do about that. I, I sort of got home and suffered for a couple of days, uh, ended up in an ambulance six days later to discover that I had actually multiple fractures or eight ribs, and I punctured my lung. Um, so they've cut all my back out and spread the ribs, taken out a few bits of lung, um, which is why I'm smoking. Uh, and uh, that wasn't very good news last year. Uh, I just tick by as I can, as mm. long as I bloody Mary in the morning and an agresco about lunchtime and then over a bottle of wine, um, roll a couple of cigarettes in this outrageously expensive world, you know, I'm all right. Yes, well, you've certainly, um, you've certainly earned it. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I'm certainly taking it. Mm. Hey, you'll be lucky living, living in France because... I was, um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but I was a tobacco smuggler back in the day. <laughs> we used to hit a warehouse in Belgium, I think it was, not far from the French border, and fill up our car to the gunnels, then back through the Channel Tunnel, dump it all in a, a B&B in, in Dover, and then back, back through the tunnel again, all with no sleep. And um, God, we we did so many trips, and then finally we we pulled off that channel tunnel off the train. I mean, and all the cops and the customs were there waiting for us, and they're like, "Stop, <laughs> follow this car, please." And um, they took us in this big warehouse, which was full of God knows how many other vehicles that were all clearly smuggling vehicles. There were Toyota yeah. Hiuses and vans and all this stuff. They said, um, they interrogated us. We said, it's personal use. <coughs> oh, you intend to smoke 5,000 packets of gold in Virginia, Mr. Thrall, do you? Uh, well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and they said, right, we'll do your deal. Um, you can claim it's for personal use and we'll take you to court and you can drive away now. But we'll tell you, you will lose in court or you leave the car leave everything in it, leave everything in it, and the door's there. <laughs> so the four of us looked at each other and went, next thing we're trying to find a, trying to find a bus stop to take us back down to bloody Devon. It was, uh, yes, but uh, yeah, you've got the uh, wonderful cigarette prices over here to uh, adjust to now. So now I'm rolling my own. Yes. Anyway, you no. Know- there's nothing that us guys who've served like more than a bit of drama. It is the grey, tedious, administrative, have you paid a guest bill that drives <laughs> mad. A bit of claret, a few bangs. That's what we live for. Yes. You get one life, and if you live it right, one, one is enough. Exactly. <laughs> Robert, listen, it's been absolutely wonderful to finally meet you. Um, 
we've been invaded by uh, the yeah. solar influences. Playing about that, really. There we go. Chris. There we go. Yes, it, it's um, yes, it's f- wonderful to finally meet you, and um, your story is just a p- particularly meaningful and and simultaneously emotional. For, I think for any any former service person and thank you for your kind words about the podcast it's um gosh uh, say again fuck the good work and keep putting it out there chris Important yeah what our guys do wow it's an absolute honor to to hear that from you robert thank you so much um please stay on the line so i can just thank you properly but for the purposes of the tape thank Thank you so much. Thank you for what you've uh, done for my country, uh, nation, I should say. And um, to everybody at home, please, if you could like and subscribe. Uh, It's probably been the chat I'd look forward to the most on Bought the T-shirt. And uh, I really hope you've, uh, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word, but you've got as much out of it as I have. Massive love to you all. See you soon.